Hello everyone and welcome to Stay at Home Shakespeare with A Bit Lit. I'm Emma Whipday and today in the second video of the series I'm going to be thinking about the balcony in Romeo and Juliet, except the title of this video is a little bit of a contradiction because in fact I'm going to be suggesting that the balcony in Romeo and Juliet isn't what matters and indeed there might not even be a balcony. What matters is the window and I'm going to say a little bit more about this in a moment. But I wanted to start off by returning to an idea I was exploring last week. Um, Stay at home Shakespeare, as you may remember. Um, it gives me an opportunity both to think about Shakespeare while in my home and hopefully talk to you about Shakespeare while you may be in your home, but also to think a little bit about what Shakespeare is doing with the idea of the home, particularly the ideal of the home and anxieties about the home, which seem particularly pertinent to me in the moment, at the moment as I'm stuck in my home in lockdown. And I want to draw on a particular set of literature today that informed general thinking about the home in Shakespeare's England, and that's what was known as conduct literature, so literature that told people how to behave. A famous example of this at the time was a book by someone called Thomas Tusser called Five Hundredth Points of Good Husbandry and as many of good housewifery or huswifery. So this is essentially telling people how to be a good husband, which doesn't just mean being married to a, a wife in this period, but also means being someone who maybe tills the land or is a farmer or looks after his land and his home, um, and also how to be a good housewife. And this is a conduct book that's written entirely in rhyme, which makes it very enjoyable to read, printed in 1573, so around 20 years before Romeo and Juliet was written. But it was very influential in the way it set out how a husband and how a housewife ought to behave. And Tussa wrote, Make husbandry daily abroad to provide, Make huswifery daily at home for to guide, Make coffer fast locked thy treasure to keep, make house to be sure, the safer to sleep. And these were some of the first things he wrote in his book. And essentially what he seems to be saying here in Make Husbandry Daily Abroad to Provide is that a husband or the man of the house ought to go abroad to work, ought to work outside the home. He's being defined in relation to the home, but he's outside of it. And the next line, make huswifery daily or housewifery daily at home for to guide, suggests that the opposite is true for women. You may remember that in my previous video on contagious witchcraft in Macbeth, I talked about how the home is often associated in this period with the female body. And that's true here. So the idea is that a good housewife orders things at home and is at home just as her husband goes abroad. Tussa continues, make coffer fast locked by treasure to keep. So essentially he's talking about locking up the goods of the home, the treasure and the money and keeping that safe. And then make house to be sure the safer to sleep. So suggesting that there's some anxiety about keeping the house safe at night when it's most vulnerable. And making sure that it's locked up. And these are things I'm going to come back to later in this video. The second bit of conduct literature I wanted to chat about is um, about 20 years later, um, published in 1591, Henry Smith's A Preparative to Marriage, so designed to get married couples ready to wed each other. And Smith says, we call the wife housewife, that is house, wife, to show that a good wife keeps her house as though home were chastity's keeper. So a wife should teach her feet, go not beyond her door. And Smith is being over the top here. Of course, lots of women did go outside their homes and cross the threshold of their doorways in this period. But he's talking about an ideal where a woman is so associated with her home that she rarely goes outside it. She's defined by her home and that she doesn't cross thresholds lightly. And you'll see that the doorway, the threshold is particularly significant here. He also links this staying home with her chastity. So if she were his daughter and a virgin, that would be defined by staying at home and being virginal. Or if she's his wife, that would be defined by being faithful to him and not committing adultery. So we've got this interconnected web of ideas here in relation to the female body being kept preserved, the home being kept preserved, inviolable, shut in, inviolable, sorry, shut in, locked up. 
um, and this idea that female chastity and that the treasure of the home are both associated with keeping things locked and shut within the household and avoiding the thresholds. In fact, a lot of imagery in this period associated women who were prostitutes or who were sexual or who were dangerous with the threshold. So, for example, there's a pamphlet in this period called um, The Arraignment of Margaret Fernseed, which is about a woman who kept a brothel in her home unbeknownst to her husband, and then when he found out, killed him. And the image of this woman on the front of this pamphlet is of her standing in her doorway, looking out to the world beyond. So the image of women in windows and doorways is associated with dangers they pose to the home, with the idea that they make the home vulnerable through, being, um, through appearing in the thresholds open to the male gaze. So how does this relate to the theatre in this period? Well, the Globe Theatre, which wasn't in fact built at the time Shakespeare was writing Romeo and Juliet, but is often the theatre people have most easily in their minds when thinking about that kind of theatre, shows us that theatres in this period had a single stage entering into the yard where the groundlings would have stood, so people who paid a penny for their tickets. Um, and it has pillars coming up at the front of the stage, and then it has a balcony at the back of the stage above the stage doors. And this basically gives us the model of what a theatre would have looked like in this period if it were an amphitheatre, open air, outdoor theatre, which is where we believe Romeo and Juliet would have been performed at an outdoor theatre. Um, and the key thing about the description I've just given is how easily these architectural features of the theatre map onto a house. And I can show you this by showing you this amazing pop-up globe theatre that I happen to have. And you'll see here that you'll see the groundlings standing in front, you'll see the stage behind them with the pillars, and then you'll see at the back the balcony, which is the, at the same level of some of the seats in the theatre, which are sort of galleries round about the theatre. And so that balcony can easily map on to a window in the play, and the stage doors that you see below can easily map on to the front door of a house. So you'll see there how much it resembles a house. And of course, this becomes key in Romeo and Juliet when there is the famous balcony scene where Juliet is inside her home, inside, to be specific, her father's home, because of course it's the father who owns and runs the home in this period. Um, and Juliet is standing on the balcony, looking into the outside world, into the garden. And there she has a love scene with Romeo, who's standing in the garden, even though he's her family's enemy. But the key thing about this scene is there is a balcony at the theatre. That's the upper stage, so she's standing on it, displayed, but far away from the lower stage. But there isn't explicitly a balcony in the play. What there is, is a window. So you may remember that Romeo's first line when he looks up and sees Juliet is, but soft, what light through yonder window breaks? And that seems to be quite clearly telling the audience that what's important here, whether or not she's on a balcony, is that Juliet is standing in the window of her father's house. She's in that position I just talked about, of a, of a position of display, of being vulnerable to the outside world and making herself vulnerable. And we know that also it's night time in this scene, both because of the context, it's after the Capulet's ball, but also because Romeo fancifully compares Juliet to the sun. He says, it is the east and Juliet is the sun. Arise, fair sun, and kill the envious moon. So he's setting up the idea that we're in the moonlight, it's dark. And this is important for him to set up because this is in, as I've said, an outdoor amphitheatre playhouse. And therefore, there would have been daylight. People would have been watching this in the day. But the audience needs to know that for the characters, this is night. So he refers to the moonlight, then calls Juliet a sun and talks about her being visible in the window. But Juliet is making herself visible in the window because she doesn't think of herself as being on display there to the outside world because it only looks over her father's garden. So she still essentially psychologically feels indoors. She's inside even though in fact she's in the in-between space between outside and out inside. And therefore she feels able to talk to herself, and more importantly, to talk to an imagined Romeo. She starts by saying, I, me, and Romeo comments, she speaks, and significantly, he's talking to us here, 
telling us that Juliet is speaking. So I talked about the significance of the balcony, but it's also significant that Romeo is on the lower stage here and is therefore very close to the groundlings, to the audience member. So you can see that if he's standing there, he's close to us and we're joining with him at looking up at Juliet. And therefore he tells us that she speaks and puts us in the position of also eavesdropping on her and watching her. And thinking she's alone, thinking she's private in her home, she says, O Romeo, Romeo, wherefore art thou, Romeo? Deny thy father and refuse thy name. Or if thou wilt not, be but sworn my love, and I'll no longer be a Capulet. And Romeo, continuing to talk to us, to the audience, says, Shall I hear more, or shall I speak at this? She continues saying how much she loves him and asking him to take all of herself. And eventually he calls out, I take thee at thy word, call me but love, and I'll be new baptised, henceforth I never will be Romeo. And Juliet responds, What man art thou that thus bescreenst in night, so stumblest on my counsel? So I talked a bit earlier about the significance of night time as a time when the home is vulnerable to, to robbers, to um, outsiders trying to come in. So the home needs to be locked up and the treasure needs to be locked up. And this is the anxiety that Juliet is expressing here, that because it's night time, Romeo's able to come and, and eavesdrop on her and make her vulnerable. But then, of course, she realises who he is and says to him, How camest thou hither? Tell me, and wherefore? So how did you come here and why? The orchard walls are high and hard to climb, and the place death, considering who thou art, if any of my kinsmen find thee here. So in a moment, she's shifting from being someone protecting the boundaries of her home, wanting to know what strange man has made his way into the garden, to being someone who's allied with Romeo, with the outsider, in making herself visible to the outside world and in allowing herself eventually to be stolen away in the language of the period because she's going to elope with him. So she goes from protecting her home against Romeo to siding with him in her willingness to hide him from her kinsman's eyes and eventually elope. And there's a tension here that Shakespeare's playing with between the idea of Juliet as a possession, as an object, as a treasure. So she's part of the things that are locked up in her father's house and being kept safe. And of Juliet as a free agent, as a person, as a woman who has the responsibility, or at least partial responsibility in this period, for keeping herself locked up within the home with the treasure, but who chooses to unlock herself and free herself to elope. And you can see a similar pattern in the play The Merchant of Venice, where it's slightly complicated by the fact that the woman who appears in the window is Jessica, the daughter of Shylock, who in the anti-Semitic anti Venice of the play is an outsider, and therefore her being stolen away from him, or stealing herself away from him, is slightly more complex. When Lorenzo first approaches the house in order to elope with Jessica, we hear him say, Approach, here dwells my father Jew. Ho, who's within? So you see he defines the house in relation to Shylock, and he's thinking at least partly of revenging himself on Shylock, of stealing Jessica from Shylock, as well as thinking of loving Jessica herself. And she says, who are you? Tell me for more certainty, albeit I swear that I do know your tongue. So again, we're being reminded she can't see who he is because it's dark. Again, this is someone being stolen away from her father's house at night. Um, when she realises who she, he is, however, we get the sense that she's not just a possession to be stolen, she is quite directly the person doing the stealing. She says, here, catch this casket, it is worth the pains. She's changed herself into a boy and she's throwing down her father's money to him. So there's a sense here that she's stealing herself as her father's possession, but she's also quite literally stealing her father's possessions. Um, and Lorenzo says to her, descend, for you must be my torchbearer. And she says, what, must I hold a candle to my shames? They in themselves, good sooth, are too, too light. Why, it is an office of discovery, love, and I should be obscured. And there's a tension here between the idea that she wants to hide herself because she's ashamed of dressing as a boy, because she's ashamed of eloping, but also a pun on the word light, which could mean sexually promiscuous in this period. And the fact that she's throwing down money and there's a mon money exchange, a monetary exchange involved, and the fact that she's thinking about herself in these sexual terms and is ashamed, relates to the world of the images I talked about earlier in the video, images of women 
in windows and in doorways who are opening themselves up to the male gaze. She ends the scene by saying, I will make fast the doors and gild myself with some more ducats, so again playing on that imagery of monetary exchange, and be with you straight. And the irony there is she says, I will make fast the doors, so she's locking up the house. And in this, she's doing what her father asked her to do earlier in the play. He says, lock, lock up my doors. But he also said, clamber not you up to the casements then, nor thrust your head into the public street. So Shylock is nervous about the potential of Jessica being seen in a window and what it might lead to if she's in the private home, but her head's thrust out into the public street. And there's a sense here, again, there's a tension between the fact that she's locking up the house, she's keeping it safe, but she's also using her control over the locks to unlock herself, to free herself from being her father's possession, but also her father's loving daughter, in order to run away with the man she loves. And we see this image of the window another time in Shakespeare's works, in Othello, which I'm going to be talking about more in a couple of weeks. In this play, rather startlingly, we don't see Desdemona, who elopes with Othello, standing framed in a window. Instead, Shakespeare turns this convention upside down. He has Desdemona's father standing in the window when he realises his daughter has fled. So Iago comes on crying, Awake, what ho, Brabantio! Thieves, thieves, thieves! Look to your house, your daughter and your bags! Thieves, thieves! And he later asks, Are your doors locked? So here you can see Iago is associating Desdemona with the objects within her home, with the house, with herself, and with her bag, his bags or his bags of money. So there's a sense that she's being described by Iago as a possession. But in asking, are your doors locked? Again, Iago is showing knowledge of the fact that Desdemona isn't just an object, she's an agent, she's a person, and she can unlock the doors to run away with her love and free herself. So that's the end of my video today. I just wanted to give you a brief exploration of the liminality of the thresholds of the home, which is the in-betweenness of the thresholds of the home, the windows and doorways, and how these map onto the stage door, and particularly the balcony in the stage space, to explore what makes homes vulnerable, what opens them up to the outside world, and what enables these women to step outside the authority of their fathers and the authority of the home in order to elope. 